Thanks so much, John. This has been uh, already an immensely intellectually enriching week, and uh, it's just a great honor and pleasure to be here. So what I'm going to present today is essentially, uh, I would summarize it as the most controversial part of a large draft manuscript. Because I think, hey, if you're coming to Cambridge, you might as well try to stir the water a bit. So, <laughs> and then get, to, get, to, get the best mind sort of thinking about something that I, I still am a little iffy on, but I would love to hear sociological, political economy, uh, other social scientific and other perspectives on um, the, the, the key concept that I'll be talking about today. And the book project this is coming out of is a book called Laws of Robotics, Revitalizing the Professions in an Era of Automation. And I would summarize the main theme of this project as an effort to move beyond some of the usual uh, bromides or ways of thinking about automation as either it's going to take all the jobs and leave us in a dystopia or it's going to um, do everything for us and bring us to a utopia. I'm trying to bring forward some ideas here about what a realistic, uh, progressive, inclusive prosperity thanks to technology would look like. And so with that, you know, I, I should start though with the sort of standard story that I'm arguing against. And the standard story, I would say, is something along the lines that surveillance plus machine learning equals human replaceability. And I know if you uh, live and listen to uh, David Runciman's podcast, you probably heard the interview with uh, Yuval Noah Harari, uh, and, and he has sort of talked about the ways in which if you can have machines that just watch what people do all the time, turn that surveillance into data, then turn that into robotics that can use sort of sensors and actuators to mimic what those people are doing, that they're essentially replaceable and you have a massive redundant class of human beings, right? And one of the things I think is really critical about this standard story is that it models the advances in manufacturing as a model for the future of services. So the idea is, you know, in Adam Smith's time, you could have one worker at a pin factory could make perhaps 20 pins a day. Now a worker who just flips on a button at a pin factory would probably be making 100,000 pins a day. And that similarly, those types of advances of, of uh, productivity are things we should see in the rest of the economy, in services, even in education, healthcare, et cetera. And so this is a standard story that I want to try to dispute. And I'm gonna have a few attacks, a few angles of attacks on it. One of them is going to be questioning the value of artificial intelligence as a summum bonum, as the end point of research in human-computer interaction, in machine learning, um, in predictive analytics, big data. The fundamental confrontation here is something that John Markoff has described in his book, Machines of Loving Grace, as a tension that's existed in the community of artificial, of researchers in this area since at least the 1950s. So if you read Markov's book, you see, for example, lots of people at MIT who had a vision of artificial intelligence, eventually machines replacing humans. You had the great quote from Herbert Simon, I think from 1958, who said, you know, we're just around the corner to a point in the 60s where machines will take over basically all the human work, you know. And, 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 and the, there were many people at that time who were sort of puffing AI as, and, and there was a, a, a panic over AI taking human jobs that was almost exactly parallel in the 1960s as it is today. If you look, for example, at Daniel Axt's uh, history of that time period, um, you had exactly that type of panic because of the folks in AI. But you also had simultaneously people like Doug Engelbart who were promoting a vision of intelligence augmentation where machines would be assisting humans in performing their work better, right? And examples of this abound, you know. So if we want to think about augmenting human intelligence, we can think about, for example, an attorney who at one point may have had to comb through tons of dusty books in order to find the right case for uh, the argument he was making, and then being augmented by um, Word software or machine, the Microsoft Word software to do, be a better word processor, by Westlaw, by other search engines to be a better researcher, um, even by now predictive analytics that help them say, these are the types of arguments that can win a case, these are the ones that cannot, et cetera. And all of these are ways in which you could frame them as augmenting intelligence. But of course, you know, the media, all of the technology that I just uh, brought up, loves to frame each of those as all being on a path to you're getting a robot lawyer, right? <laughs> and, and part of what I'm going to talk about today is how do you dispute that? How do you sort of 
uh, when we hear the repeated invocations in the media, in the popular press, that all of these advances in technology are about replacing workers and especially professionals, how can we come back and respond to those and say, in fact, there are multiple paths open. We're not just on a path toward replacement. I mean, one, by the way, just in the example of law, and I'll indulge with a legal example. I, I won't focus on law in this talk, but you know, there was a, recently a chat bot that was introduced that was called a robot lawyer, uh, put forward by a guy named Joshua Browder. And people were saying, this chat bot has overturned 160,000 parking tickets. And you know, that shows that we're on a path to essentially getting rid of all the lawyers and turning them into software eventually. But you know, over this, the second, when you look behind the technology and see, well, how does the chat bot actually work? Well, actually involves a lot of judgment and effort by the person who's using it. And then when you see, well, were there any lawyers that were actually doing this type of traffic work beforehand? I can promise you there, there are, were not that many lawyers doing that type of work before. And finally, could, is the chatbot method extrapolable to other legal disputes? I can also say, uh, based on some work I've done in an article called Four Futures of Legal Automation, probably not. <laughs> because the level of simplicity there is, is, is quite high, and a lot of legal disputes are not that simple. But what I want to focus on in this talk is a lot of examples that involve not just the Hubert Dreyfus argument that there are things that machines will not be able to do, but there, that there are things that machines should not do because of the degree of human values and governance involved in the work that is putatively uh, machine learnable, but in fact would be quite uh, distorting of human values were it to be uh, done by machines. So here are three commitments that I have in terms of principles of intelligence augmentation for robots. Okay? And these are three principles I develop in the manuscript. And by the way, if anyone's interested in reading that and commenting, I'd love to share it. Um, I, I know the publication timetable will be quite some time, so I love getting comments on this work. And one is that robot systems should complement professionals rather than replacing them. And I know that there is a huge amount of material out there of critiques of the professions coming both from a sort of neoliberal market orientation, characterizing the professions as restraints on competition, a public choice, a, a, a critique of the professions as people just trying to help themselves to a larger share of the economic pie. And of course, uh, particularly in England, but many other places in, in the UK, a Marxist critique of the professions, right? There's a critique on the other side that says, that characterizes them as forms of power, as sort of a new uh, class that is trying to work its will on others. I'm aware of that, of, of that type of critique, but I think it's come time to sort of push back a bit on, against that and to try to isolate or to find legitimate professionalism, which to me is the self-organization and governance of a field that is demonstrably committed to advancing the field Reflect and reflecting human values. And what I will give, I hope, is concrete examples in the rest of the talk are examples where when we allow doctors, nurses, others to govern the profession of medicine or to co-govern it with bureaucrats and with technologists, or when we allow teachers and other educational professionals to co-govern the development of education with technologists, with administrators, with finance and others, that this will lead to better results not only for the workers, but for the quote-unquote consumers. And I put quotes around that because I don't think of patients and students as consumers. I think of them as being, that role as being distinct. So that's going to one part of my principles about intelligence augmentation for robotic systems. A second is that robotic systems should respect the task at hand rather than redefining it. I know there will be many people who will say, eventually it's going to be so easy for a machine learning software to pick out what is a cancerous mole on someone's hand, and what is a benign, uh, benign mole, right? I don't dispute that. But the job of a dermatologist is not simply finding whether someone has a cancerous mole or not, right? So not simply making that diagnosis. Lots of difficult decisions about how do we cut into the mole? Do we decide to send this person for a full body CT scan? Do we tell them, say, they might, if they're relatively wealthy, maybe you want to pay for a PET scan? Or maybe you don't tell them that. Um, do you tell them other sorts of things about their, their, their body? Do you give them certain options about how they deal with it? Do they go into watchful waiting or not, et cetera? And by the way, there's a wonderful article just in the recently in The New Yorker by Siddhartha Mukherjee that talks about the ways in which dermatology applications were thought to get rid of the role of the dermatologist. You know, it was thought that if you're a dermatologist, if you're a pathologist, radiologist, this is just pattern recognition and you're like a buggy whip manufacturer. 
But it turns out that many of these apps end up being complementary to the professionals. So there's so many people that, for example, don't have the time, the inclination to see a dermatologist, but if their primary care doctor, their GP, has an app that they could just scan them with and say, oh, well, you know, that mole looks a little iffy, all of a sudden you might have a flood of people going to dermatologists because you have so more, many more people who, thanks to the complementary automation, are now being identified as potential patients for the human professional, right? And so that is an issue that I think is very important in terms of respecting the task at hand. Similarly, you know, education is not the test or the degree, right? It's not just some sort of like quantifiable endpoint that I can regurgitate a set amount of, of material on a certain day in June or what have you. Sorry to, to state that during exam period here, but you know, it, it's not just the test, right? It's not just sort of getting, being able to you know, develop a, a, a collection of badges online in the new uh, vernacular of online learning, which tries to reduce everything to a, uh, a credential that can be sort of uh, distilled into some momentary test that you can take to prove your competence. My view is that fundamentally education can be identified as a, the, the, the processes that now are the dominant forms of education are constitutive of that activity. It's not as if that activity is only valuable insofar as it produces uh, certain results. And this theory of the constitutive good, I admit, is you know, a contestable one, but it's developed in a lot of philosophical critiques of technology. If you look, for example, at Albert Borgman on focal practices, on some of Langdon Winner's works, there's a lot of very good work there, sort of developing the idea that there are constitutive goods, and part of this constitutive identity of activity is the task at hand, you know, rather than sort of redefining it, et cetera. Now, robotic systems also, I think, should avoid zero-sum arms races rather than intensifying them. I'm going to say here, you're not going to hear too much about the third part today because the book, it basically is divided into a part in empirics and a part in theory. And I talk in two chapters about health and education, which is what I'm going to talk more about right now. My chapters, though, on law and on uh, uh, my, my chapters on law and on the military are much more about arms races and how automation can accelerate arms races. And so that's something that you know, I'd love to get into with folks afterward, but it's just, uh, I, I think that's a rule that we have to put forward because I don't want to, while I'm very excited about automation increasing productivity in the health and education sectors, I am very worried about automation increasing the productivity of the destruction sectors, right? <laughs> we shouldn't be necessarily happy if we find out that we've developed a machine tomorrow that for uh, the cost of $5 could automatically replicate itself and destroy the world, right? That would not be a good side of productivity as Baumol recognized, the great economist Bill Baumol recognized in his 1990 article on uh, bad forms of entrepreneurship, right? <laughs> so we have voices in the economics profession that have uh, recognized that. Now, let me talk a bit about complementing professionals. And I'll start with, you know, sort of an image of this dermatology app that I just brought up. Or this actually isn't the dermatology app I, I was talking about earlier because I was praising it. Um, there are some very good ones out there now. This is one that I believe is called Mole Detective that was actually fined by the Federal Trade Commission in the U.S. because it didn't substantiate the bases for its uh, reference to whether your uh, spot on your, your skin looked more like melanoma or more like a, uh, a benign spot on the skin. Okay. And I think one of the lessons, by the way, in terms of these dermatology apps is that to the extent one tries to replace professionals with them, you've got to also make sure that you've got the whole cadre of professionals, be they lawyers, data analysts, others, who can actually tell whether the app is substantiable or not. And sadly, one of the things that's going on in the US now is that we are seeing a move to radically deregulate this side of the sector. And I've talked to high level people at IBM, um, at other firms who want to get into it. And one of the things they're terrified of is they feel that there's going to be a Gresham's Law of Apps, where essentially deregulation will lead to a wild west. There's going to be a lot of apps out there that don't work very well. Consumers just, because there'll be a lemon's equilibrium, as Akerlof described in the used car market, and people will just say, oh, I don't want to deal with any of that stuff. I just give me a person, right? So one of the things we have to realize is that you know, there are really roles for professionals that are important in terms of vetting this stuff. Now, I see we don't have that much time, so I want to be sure to go, I'm going to go through these really quickly, but I want to be sure to, to open up the conversation for as long as I'm here, you know, uh, for anyone, if anyone's here for the days after I'm here. Scribes are a great example, too. So in the US, for when we ever we think about apps or software or artificial intelligence replacing professionals, 
we hear there's incredible data collection and that data is going to drive software that will lead to better results. But if you look at the nitty gritty of data collection in the healthcare enterprise right now, what you will find is tons of doctors utterly overwhelmed by their new second job of entering data in. So even on its own terms, even if I were to come up to you and be like the early Eric Topol, who was a doctor who had this vision of medicine being uh, really technologically supercharged, um, even if I were like him and I thought we're gonna get to a day where we're gonna have robot doctors and robot surgeons to replace all of them, I would still want some complementarity of human beings to existing medical professionals because I'd want scribes to be taking down the data that doctors are now struggling to take down. And by the way, as someone that does health law, I mean, I've done, I've read whole articles about how electronic health records enable healthcare fraud in the US because they allow you to copy and paste macros and just, you know, somebody comes with a cough, okay, here's a 30 word description of the cough that will allow me to bill for a 30 minute visit. Right? <laughs> and so this is, you get the same person, the same type of description being applied over and over again. So that's an area where, in some ways, technology is worsening care because we're not investing enough in the type of scribes or others that could help. I'll also say this with respect to mental health apps. I think there's a really good case there, and I'm going to get to that uh, in a future slide, and social care robots. Let me get into those two examples. So social and care robots are a really interesting innovation. What you're seeing on the screen is something called a PARO, and this is a Japanese robot that's sort of seen as a comfort robot for dementia care. And it's put forward as a way of helping elders and calming them when, say, they might not get personal attention in a care home, etc. And what I find most interesting about the PARO is that it's been around for so long, there are tons of studies about it. And what I love, too, is, you know, in so many of the popular books on robotics, there are so few references to the literature on studies of robotics. But if you do like a Google Scholar search even on the PARO, you'll see there have already been like 20, 30 studies of its effects in different environments. People like Cynthia Brazil do great studies of the effects of social robots. And what they find in several of the studies is that if you just give the PARO to an elderly person and just say, here's your PARO, enjoy, you know, it has a certain effect that might be relatively mollifying, et cetera. But if you try to deploy it in a social setting where you have people that can talk about it, where you have, say, a licensed professional that has some awareness of geriatric care needs, where you try to, say, have the technology be part of a social setting, there are better results, okay? Now, can I quantify it for you? Well, I will tell you that there was one um, study that tried to quantify the level of cortisol in the urine of the elders after they were exposed to the PARO, okay? I personally don't think that's a great way. I, mean, I guess if you have cortisol, that means you're stressful, et cetera, um, uh, that you're stressed out. I personally would not think that the craze for quantification should lead us to that type of, uh, <laughs> you know, but perhaps uh, we, we can get into uh, the, the philosophical aspects of uh, my uh, uh, dualism or, or sort of uh, perhaps discomfort with uh, that type of uh, a measure of mental well-being. Um, but I do think that, you know, there, there are ways in which the studies give us some narrative evidence that it is probably better to deploy certain forms of robotics in those settings. By the way, there's also a wonderful uh, Dutch documentary called Alice Cares that's about the, the deployment of certain robots uh, by social care workers in the Netherlands to elders where they're always deployed with a person and, you know, with, with sort of the ability for the elder to sort of give feedback about how the social care robot was deployed. But by the way, I mean, there are tons of people, if you look at at writ grandpa robot on Twitter, you know, this is someone that I think has, is in Britain and has been trying to develop these things for years. And it's a very interesting thing, you know, in terms of how we envision the future of care. But I would envision a future of care where these complement human professionals, they don't replace them. Okay. A second version of this is automated mental illness flags. So, Probably, ever, uh, many here are probably aware of the Samaritan's radar. That was a bit of a scandal, I guess, because this was an a, a automated system that would allow you to opt in to have the system scan the tweets of your friends, and if your friends said something that looked suicidal or despairing, it might tell you, hey, a tweet of your friend is worrying, here are things you might want to do with, uh, about that, right? To me, one of the fundamental problems with this is, first, you know, I think that there should have been more people involved. Um, and maybe they're, you know, and that's one problem. But the second problem is consent, right? I mean, the, the people who are being watched didn't have to consent to being watched. And I think that's an area where, although there are certainly good critiques of data protection law and innovation, 
This is an area of fundamental human dignity where I think it does make sense, and I think ultimately it was shut down because of a complaint to data protection authorities over that type of issue. I would contrast that with a project called Project Durkheim that the Veteran Affairs Bureau did in the United States, where they were trying to tell which uh, veterans were most likely to commit suicide. There's a huge problem in the US of veterans committing suicide after coming back from the Iraq war. And they had a huge corpus of data about people who had committed suicide and the social networks data about people on the social networks who committed suicide. And they wanted to basically have people have their social network postings monitored if they seemed to be too despairing or otherwise uh, upset. But this program was premised on opt-in. You had to opt-in to what was called Project Durkheim. And I think that one of the watchwords of automation of mental illness flags should be that people do have to opt in. You know, but, I, I will, but, but I'd love to get into a discussion of it because I'm sure people can come up with counterexamples. But it's something that I feel pretty uh, strongly about. That, but the other thing that sort of is more to the point about my thesis today is that the, the suicidality triggers would lead to a call from a professional that would lead a professional to being involved. Right? So it wasn't just random people sort of saying, oh, maybe I can help out my friend. It was more involving mental health professionals. Now again, this is an area of immense controversy in the US right now because there's a lot of pressure, thanks to the opioid epidemic, to bring in people who are not licensed. Right? And this question of licensure of professionals is one that is at the core of a lot of what I'm promoting here and really goes against the grain because a lot of folks really want to get rid of licensing regimes. But I just want to put in a little word for them because I think there, this is, is an example, I think Samaritan's Radar is an example of what happens when you don't have enough proper training involved. Now in terms of education, one more contrast. Okay, So here's an example of say the robot teacher. Right? You might have the teacher that comes in and it just, and you will see now in a lot of ed tech literature, people praising these robotic systems and saying that robot could know more than any human teacher. Right? And not only that, that robot could be programmed with a sort of choose your own adventure version of every error that could conceivably be made by the children here. And what response to that error led to the right answer in the future, right? <laughs> so you could have that framed as such, and I really think that is the premise of a book like Kevin Carey's The End of College, you know, where he tries to promote a vision where colleges would only, there would only be one class for the entire country in, say, politics. And they would invest $100 million in this class. Okay? And you have $100 million of investment, and you'd have the best class possible. And it would just be all into a machine like this that would be given to all the students. right? And, but I, I dispute that, because I think fundamentally, how you teach really reflects questions of human values. There is certain subsidiarity involved, whereby local communities might have different ways of teaching. Local teachers might have different ways of teaching. And I don't think we would want this as our vision of the future. But I'm not a Luddite. Okay? <laughs> like, I really like this example, which is Cynthia Brazil's Dragon Bot. And this is just a stuffed animal with a cell phone in its face. Okay? Not super high tech. right? But what it does is it sort of works with this little pad. And the child comes home from a normal day of classes with a human teacher. And then, say this is Spanish class, it might say, you know, here is a conjugation of a verb. Is that right or not? Or sometimes what the dragon bot does is it says, I don't understand. I want to say I love you in Spanish. How do you say I love you in Spanish? And then the child sort of develops this almost cathexis, you know, with the robot saying, oh, well, you know, this is how you say it in, in Spanish. That I think is quite heartwarming in a way, you know, because as long as you have a certain balance between the human interaction with the children and having some robots to say help out with the things that might bore a parent, you know, I have to give a shout out to my dad. I mean, he helped drill me with like 5,000 spelling bee words when I was a kid, but probably would have been okay with a robot. I don't know, you know, or <laughs> could have saved him a little bit of time. So, you know, I, I have to say that there are certain ways in which we can, in a balanced way, bring in certain sort of robotic elements that would be promoting, but it wouldn't be replacing human professionals. Now, I, where's the reverse, right? Where are the places to prioritize AI over IA? Well, certainly, I think in you know, farming, mining, et cetera. I mean, it's hard for me. Now, of course, I, I hope there aren't too many miners in the room to disagree. But no, but I, and I would love to hear, actually, from miners who might say, there's a human value in my mining. And there's actually a book by Matt Crawford called Shop Class, at Soulcraft, Shop Class as Soulcraft, which tries to defend a sort of a, a certain work ethic in pure manual labor that perhaps I'm missing. But I would contrast the examples that I just gave with, say, putting up telephone poles, et cetera, 
and, and even driving. You know, and, and, and I'll leave it to the audience to decide whether I'm saying that the president uh, should be automated or, or, or truck driving. Um, but, but, but these are places where I think you could prioritize. But I want to admit it's a binary and not a spectrum. It's not a binary, it's a spectrum, right? I'd see the important services that you don't want to sort of accelerate automation of too quickly, they implicate questions of values and governance. I don't know if there's that many questions of values and governance in terms of like how well the tomato gets picked or how fast the, the diamonds or coal are taken out of, well, the coal perhaps, but, but the, how fast we mine, et cetera. But I do think there are important questions, more clear, uh, clearly implicated questions of value in some of the professions that I brought up earlier. I'd also say that, you know, even in, and, and to further that concession, even in driving, Toyota has a spectrum of control from guardian to chauffeur mode. And it's interesting there too, where they want to say, we want to really allow people to have some choice in their technology. And I saw this great presentation by the, uh, one of the VPs at Tokyo in, uh, in, in Toyota in Tokyo a, a few months ago, where he had an amazing uh, account of why you want to preserve this guardian mode where the car is only preventing you from making big errors and getting into accidents, right? Um, but letting people drive. Uh, he, he gave this sort of very rich account of the sort of forms of autonomy someone may feel in their driving, okay? And so, you know, maybe that is the case and we should develop these, but I think that it's clearer that the case against full automation is clearer in the, the professions of health and education that I just gave. And I think that, you know, my bottom line would be these concerns of values and ethical and political issues don't arise as consistently in a, in a complex a fashion in, in, um, in, in these other fields like driving as they do in professions like health and education, okay? Now, what's gonna, this, I've given you a pretty cheery vision of human-machine cooperation. But of course, there's a opposition to this, right? And where does the opposition come from? Well, I think the problem is that there are many, many people that essentially characterize the health and education sectors as parasitic, as drags on productivity, who say that we must cut the cost of school, of college, of hospitals, of doctors as much as possible. Certainly that is the idea behind the growth of online charter schools in the US. There's an idea that now we're spending $10,000 a pupil. Why not just have kids stay at home? They don't have to deal with a big scary world. They just stay with their parents and then they watch charter school on TV. Of course, these are at some charter schools that they've been evaluated 180 days of instruction, zero days of learning. But anyway, <laughs> the, the, the US is, is nothing if not experimentalistic. So you'll you expect to see many, many more of these, especially with Betsy DeVos in charge, because this is something she deeply believes in. Um, it certainly is a theme of the American Health Care Act, which cuts enormous amounts of money away from health care. Um, and is trying to, and, and the, the, the premise behind some of it is that, you know, people don't need expensive uh, people working on them. They can uh, choose their own care. They could choose to get their own care from an app, or they could just choose to Google it, et cetera, um, rather than going to a doctor to see if they're sick. But what's odd to me is that this elite policy circles, I think, often buy into this idea. It's not just, you know, a Republican idea. It's you talk to the people at the OECD, you talk to lots of people in Europe. There are lots of publications from the European Commission that say, how much is each country spending on education or on healthcare? How much can we bring that down, et cetera? And it's, it's a relatively, I think, received wisdom that we should shrink the health and education sectors. But what's so odd to me is that you have simultaneously a lot of elite people, elites in policy circles saying, worrying that automation will cause mass unemployment. And to me, there's this relatively simple fix, right? I mean, you have healthcare growing relatively fast. You, you can bring a lot of people that were in the jobs that are really directly threatened by automation into these two sectors. But why doesn't it happen, right? And I think one of the reasons, that, well, well, one of the reasons it doesn't happen is because of something called the cost disease. And here again, this is an idea that came out of economics in the 50s and 60s, and it was by both Baumol and Blinder. They examined, at that time, the arts. And the question was, why does our computers, why do our computers, our cars, other manufactured goods keep getting cheaper and cheaper and cheaper, but we're paying so much for healthcare, and we still pay so much for the orchestra and for other forms of uh, entertainment, so live entertainment, et cetera. And they coined this term, this cost disease, which is meant to, to, to contrast the relative productivity advance of what they call the productive sectors, like manufacturing, and the lack of productivity advance of a stagnant sector, 
right? I mean, and we could go to a seminar at, in Cambridge in 1300, and we could go to one in 2017, and you might still have one Don teaching six people, right? You know, that might be the, in, in that particular uh, setting. And that would be the critique, right, and the cost disease. But what's really odd to me is that so many people that bring up the cost disease, they look to the 50, articles from the 1950s and 60s where it was initially described. They don't look at the more recent work by Baumol where it's almost like he reverses his perspective on the cost disease. And here's how the reversal happens. By 2012, he was clearly stating, first of all, that the so-called productive sectors may not be all that productive at all because the cheapening of technologies that generate pollution and destruction was a much greater threat than the cost disease and services. It was clear he was committed to that by 2012. Second, and by the way, Baumol just, died, I think, passed away this month. So it's kind of a, a, a very well, uh, in terms of the timing, it's really a good time to celebrate his, his later work, or, or, or all of his work, but particularly this work. And he said that, you know, assuming reasonable growth rates, even continual risings in the GDP share taken by the stagnant sectors, health and education, um, could be supported by developed economies. But I would take these points further. And I would say that austerity in health and education could easily promote a downward spiral in economic activity. I promise you, if the American Health Care Act is passed, you will see this, this downward spiral in American cities because they're going to cut the legs out from under the main institutions that keep cities like, frankly, my own city, Baltimore, Detroit, Pittsburgh, any large Midwestern city. If you cut the, the heart out of the hospital, if you decrease its reimbursements by 20, 30, 40%, which could easily happen with this bill, that's going to cause a knock-on effect that will cause unemployment among the people there. They're going to spend less in other businesses. Those businesses are going to close. They're not going to be employing people. It is really a recipe for exactly the advice that Mellon gave to Hoover in 1929. Liquidate everything, right? That's what will happen. And so the, the worry that I have, and the, the way that I reverse this, is I say there is a cost cure that sustained growth in the stagnant sectors may be the only way to maintain flows of funds that sustain the economy, okay? And that I, I try to call that the paradox of, thrift, of cost after Keynes's paradox of thrift, right? Because exactly Keynes's idea in the paradox of thrift was that we might all save money individually by not spending, but if it turns out that I don't spend something on the bakery and then the baker loses his job and then doesn't spend something on what I make, then we're both out of luck, right? And so this is the problem that I have and this is something that I think Baumol himself recognized. Now, here is a thought experiment, you know, to try to show what Baumol and how Baumol quantified something like this, okay? So, and this is from two parts of the cost disease book. One, uh, the, one chapter called The Survivable Cost Disease and then an even more intense version of this called, yes, we can afford it. We can afford better, more and better health care uh, and education. And he contrasted 2005 when 15% of GDP was spent on health care to a potential 2105 where if the growth in health spending continued at the pace it was at in 2005, 62% of GDP would be spent on health care, 38% on all else. Now that might sound like a nightmare, right? To any contemporary health economist, this would be held out as the nightmare vision of a society suffocated by a rapacious healthcare sector, right? But let's look at if we have, I think his rate of growth was about 2% in this figure. If we had a rate of growth of about 2% from 2005 to 2105, there's a bit of a miracle of compounding interest where essentially the, the, tw the per capita GDP would be up to about $400,000 at that time. That's real dollars, that's not you know, due to inflation. That's like someone nowadays making $400,000 a year. It would be that high. And so even if 62% of three-fifths of that was being spent on healthcare, you would still see the average family being pretty happy because they'd have a certain amount, this 40% or so, which would be about $100,000 of purchasing power in 2105, okay? Now, admittedly, these long-term projections are hard, right? I mean, that's one of the lessons of the recent global financial crisis is it's hard to extrapolate what growth spent figures will be. But all that I'm putting this forward as is just a thought experiment to say, are we really right to be terrified of, and this is an extreme version, right? I mean, there's an old saying in economics, something that can't go on forever won't go on forever, right? And so I think that very unlikely that 62% of GDP would be taken by healthcare costs, but 
What Dalmal does is he even takes that extreme example and finds a way to justify it. There's a lesser version of this argument, a weaker version of, version of this argument in the great health economist David Cutler's work where he says even if health GDP, GDP of 25% were spent on healthcare, he questions whether that would really be a problem for the economy, a real drag on current economies. And uh, I think that's also a very important insight because, and, and by the way, I know this slide, this is probably the most provocative slide of my whole talk. I have a 20,000 word article called The Hidden Costs of Healthcare Cost Cutting, where I try to develop it a bit. And so, and I'd love to talk about it more in Q&A. But the bottom line here is that I don't think it's something to panic over if we see the so-called stagnant sectors taking more of GDP. Another question though might be, look, 25, 40, 50, 60 percent of GDP is a lot of GDP. Why are we investing in health, education, and other human services professions? And I would say that a question of co-governance is really the key there. In a lot of the examples that I gave earlier in the talk, they're about very sensitive areas of human life. Your child, you know, your five or six year old child, how are they treated? How are they being treated as a, as a growing uh, human being who can be a worker and a citizen and a family member? Uh, your time in the hospital that might be your most difficult time in your life. You know, uh, if I were to have a heart attack right now and go to the hospital, I'm sure that would be one of the most difficult times in my life, right? And how are you treated at that point? Um, in other sort of areas of health and education, mental health issues. You know, I think there's, there's a very high percentage of people that suffer from mental health issues. How do we treat that? And do we treat that as simply something to be fixed or as something that involves pretty difficult questions of values, of local community values perhaps, of other values? And so I think that you know, it's, if you have decisions like between extending, extending a patient's life or assuring quality of time and life remaining or between attending to a disruptive students or simply ordering out of the room, very hard to automate those types of decisions. You know, we should be cautious about it. And I think that another aspect of this argument is that the alternative is quite ugly. The ostensibly technical argument that all of these professional decisions are reducible to data patterns or reproducible by machines, that's really ultimately a political argument to put one or two sectors. And what are these sectors? They're the sectors I talk about in my Black Box Society book, the technology sector and the finance sector. It's to put them in charge of the future development of healthcare, education, et cetera. Okay? Even though you may not like the professions, I think my argument is that if you were to have the entire governance of the future of health and education done by technology and finance firms, you might like that worse. <laughs> but maybe you'd like it better, I don't know. But, but I just want to put forward the professions as an alternative. And I think also, and, and here unfortunately we're running out of time, but I, I can go into this further in Q&A, policy and law are key. It's not as if we face a future of automatic technological advance where advances in machine learning dictate the future of what medicine or healthcare or in general or education look like. We can make rules about how we budget, about how, what end of life care looks like, about licensing, about global caps on health spending. If you put a global cap on, you're definitely going to be accelerating, I'd say, more automated solutions. If you don't, you don't. About malpractice law, like if something goes wrong, um, contract in terms of service, do you allow, say, the makers of robotic surgeons to just foist all liability off on the entity that hires them, or do you hold them responsible for what goes wrong? All of those decisions are incredibly important to the scope and scale and pace of automation. And so this is really where the debate should be in many of these areas, and that's what I'm trying to address in my manuscript, and hopefully the book will be out in a year or two, is how do we fine tune these very fine grained decisions about how you develop law and policy in these areas to promote a vision of intelligence augmentation in the professions as opposed to one of artificial intelligence? My closing thoughts from Baumol are that, uh, you know, this is from, from the Cost Disease book. If improvements to healthcare are hindered by this illusion that we cannot afford them, we'll all be forced to suffer from self inflicted wounds. Okay. The main threat to this happy prospect is the illusion that society can't afford them, right? And this was exactly the key into Keynes's paradox of thrift as well. And the robot question, by the way, and I, by the way, I have to give us a final tribute to Keynes. This is a uh, still from Derek Jarman's film Wittgenstein, um, where I think the Keynes, while he was bursar at King's College, he sort of was a, this is a way of dramatizing his view of stop and smell the roses, you know, uh, don't sort of fall for austerity. And I think my bottom line here is to say that the robot question really is ultimately a matter of political economy and social theory. Do we invest in human expertise or just try to replace it? 
You know, do we recognize cost as mere waste? Or do we see that the cost of certain sectors is a way of recognizing that they have to be provided with a certain share of resources and buying power to preserve their ability to maintain institutions of governance and expertise? And my final sort of Walter Mitty dream today here is that a concept like the paradox of cost could be what the paradox of, to the 21st century, what the paradox of thrift was to the 20th century. A way to save us from a future of mass joblessness, political instability, and my little neologism, plutocracy, which is a uh, unity of the finance and tech sectors in control of all sectors of the economy. So with that, I hope this vision of intelligence augmentation is a bit inspiring, but I'd love to have a vigorous debate about it. So thank you. <laughs> thank, you. Thank, you. Uh, thank you very much, Frank. And what, uh, by accident, when we started this project, one of our first uh, talks was by uh, Mike Osborne of Osborne and Frank. Oh, yes, so yes. This mm -hmm. is a very nice bookmarking of the other side of it. Um, but let's talk. Great. Questions? Who wants to go first? Uh, by the <laughs> sure. David Erdos, we've, uh, we've actually been in touch on Twitter. Oh, wonderful. Been, Great. Been, Thanks been, for coming been, today. That, uh, my pleasure. Um, so um, my, my question is maybe a bit too broad, but I, on the one hand, you raise issues which sound very deontological, that there are sure. certain things machines simply should not do. And on the other hand, there's quite a strong steer that actually it's an empirical matter in many ways. It depends on the empirical evidence. So let, let's take something like Samaritan radar. I mean, if it actually was incredibly good at locating your friends right, who right. were actually in need, and it was uh, extremely well designed, um, it's not publishing that to the world in, yeah. in a way which might be stigmatic, and it's been very, very carefully thought through, and it saves many lives, say. Would we still be opposed to it? on a deontological ground. And I suppose this goes through a number of your other cases. Sure, so to sure. To what extent is it deontological, and then how do we avoid sort of ossifying ourselves? And to what extent is it, yes, these tech companies might have all sorts of economic motivations to push arguments which don't make sense, but ultimately it's for us to test them empirically to see if they do make sense. Great. No, that's a wonderful question about Samaritan's Radar. And it's one of the most difficult questions, I think, that we're facing in the automation of medical care right now because some of the most in interesting initial deployments of automation are not necessarily at the diagnosis or procedure stage, but at the stage of identifying people for entry into the healthcare system. So for example, there's already an article by Glenn Cohen in Health Affairs where he describes the hypothetical of a uh, algorithm that could be used to identify the 15 most at-risk nephrology patients at a dialysis center. And the questions that he raises are, would you require the person running that algorithm to get specific consent from all 1,000 patients to enter their data into the algorithm? That's one question. A second being, once the 15 are identified, would they be told of the algorithm and would they have an opportunity to inspect it? A third being, would the 985 out of the 1,000 who were not picked by the algorithm, would they have some right to be told that we ran something, but you weren't picked as an at-risk person? This, I think, is absolutely at the cutting edge of data protection and informed consent law and human subjects research. Because ultimately, what we're doing in the healthcare system now is we're moving from uh, we're moving towards a learning healthcare system where every clinical encounter is simultaneously data for a research purpose. Right? Where every time someone is brought in, uh, and, and to, to get to your question then, I think what I would argue is that we need to have at the, at the a baseline a very good political debate, open political debate, over the degree to which we want to enable those running the healthcare system or healthcare providers to have this type of algorithmic analysis of data that would potentially identify us as suicide risks or mentally ill. And secondly, that I would require a, a regime of data protection and an auditable regime of data protection that would prevent that type of assessment from escaping its native context of the healthcare sector and affecting, say, someone's employment, finance, tenant, or uh, other prospects. 
So I think that is the key. I mean, so I, yes, I, I, I completely agree that the Samaritan's radar could be a fantastic innovation, could really help us. Same as with the Dermap, when I mentioned, you know, there are probably lots of people now that have pretty suspicious moles that ought to be seeing a dermatologist, but that never will because they don't want to spend the time or they don't want to wait three months or what have you. Um, and, and being able to identify and pick people for that inclusion is good. But trying to ensure that the business model of that is not predicated on, oh, I find that, and then I sell it to your life insurer to make sure you never get life insurance. Um, you know, because that, the life insurer might spend a lot of money for that, right? I mean, it's, it's amazing. The, most, uh, the, the highest paid keyword on Google, I think, is for mesothelioma. Right? But that's for lawyers that are trying to help the people recover money from asbestos firms. Um, but, but you could also imagine mesothelioma searches being of intense interest by life insurance companies. So yeah, thank you. Yeah, other questions? Or, oh, wow, now everybody. All right. <laughs> Do you mind? Alan next, and okay. then I'll go here. Oh, yeah, I'll have John pick you. Yeah. <laughs> uh, Alan Blackmore, we also correspondent. Oh, great. Um, yeah. So uh, yeah, thank you have a lot of attention to the professions. Um, but I wonder if you have any uh, comment from your uh, IA analysis of the implications for uh, Pasquinelli's cognitive capitalism framing of Google, that effectively we've got a new proletariat whose uh, who's intellectual labor is being accumulated uh, through the, the infrastructure controlled by the corporations. And this is something that really affects uh, probably every, every one of us every day rather than simply the people in professions. Does, does, IA, does the IA argument also apply here? Oh, what a fantastic question. And I, I, I almost wish that you were at my talk in Berlin earlier where I did explicitly bring in the Frankfurt School. But unfortunately, I, I, I think I have a sunnier perspective, I mean, which is, goes against my disposition, but I mean, I, with, with respect to this stuff, which is to say that, you know, I mean, I will say that. So I'm afraid I'm not as familiar with Pasquinelli, but I am, I want to connect that to say Bifo Berardi's work in terms of, of a really deep critique that is at once economic and psychological of the effects of technology in terms of conditioning individuals to become certain types of individuals that best fit into a framework of promoting accumulation of capital by Google and by its investors, right? That is a powerful critique and we have to take it very seriously. And I think part of what I'm trying to get at here is that I guess that I accept that aspects of that critique with respect to the role of these companies in organizing the web, in organizing information, in organizing our lives on social media. But I simultaneously, and I simultaneously want to hope that to the extent we carve out areas of life where professions have some prerogatives of self-governance, where I, for example, can teach my law course and I'm not being judged by some techno-financial elite as to who could do the course cheaper and who could do the course in, and who could get, say, a better test for the students at the end of the term, et cetera, all the time. And I think that's very important because I can promise you any law course that would come up, uh, that Google would come up with probably would not have, say, an administrative law, my engagement with Carl Schmidt or um, with, uh, with, with uh, Jürgen Habermas. You know? And so I think this is a real problem. And, I, and so I guess my, my bottom line would be that I'm trying to look to a very old form, which is the professions, as a way of dealing with some very new problems that are posed by cognitive capitalism. Now, I think Pasquinelli, if he were here, he might come back at me and say, you are trying to carve out zones of quasi-feudal privilege for very people who are already very privileged, right? And I guess what I would say in response to that was, there's a great 1958 article, I think, called Will Everyone Become a Professional? And it was written in response to efforts to, say, professionalize lots of aspects of, Ameri uh, of occupations in the US. And I think a lot of my vision involves professionalizing a lot more work. So a very direct example I would give was home health aides. Based on Robert Kotner's work, he's a US political economist who uh, was uh, said that we have so much home health aid care being done in the US right now that's done incompetently by people who are barely paid, they don't care about the work, they're not really trained well at all. And he says, let's professionalize that role. Let's give people a lot of dignity, give them fair pay, et cetera, make it a valuable aspect of human endeavor. Simultaneously, right now in the US, there's this raging debate going on over whether child care workers should have college degrees. The bien-pensant establishment argument is absolutely not. 
This is keeping people out of the labor market, and it's part of a general trend to, of licensure and occupational licensure that has led 24% of American jobs to require licenses before they can be held. And this is a feudal elite hoarding privilege. I tell you, that's a pretty big feudal elite if it's 24%. You know, it's like, and, and, and I could say, you can easily expand that. You can easily expand that, you can bring more people into there. And frankly, I would like to see more daycare workers, others, have that because it's such a critical year. When I think you know, now of like, all the things I missed out on from one to five, and I could have learned a language, I don't know any other, like, I don't know any foreign languages, I never got exposed to sports when I was young, I never really played musical instruments, et cetera. What a waste, you know? And so if I had like daycare workers and others who really had this type of training, you could bring these people in that are very well trained, et cetera, that can really maximize the potential of children, but it involves investment. So I think that would be sort of my response would be to say, rather than, and I would say the bottom line of most establishment economic policy now is, we've made work rotten for most people, now let's destroy the last bastions where it's kind of okay, right? <laughs> and I say rather than that type of leveling, can't we have a vision of inclusive prosperity that would involve something like this type of professional identity, status, and self-governance for more and more workers rather than less and less? Thanks. Thank you. Uh, Ian Walton, um, yeah. I'll just comment quickly on that last point. I mean, clearly you're talking about two sectors, healthcare and education. And one of the experiences in the UK healthcare sector is the more you professionalise, the more you raise the cost of education that is a driver of healthcare costs. So, you know, more education actually drives up the cost of healthcare. But, but another, the point I wanted to raise was about a stagnant sector, stagnant sector you didn't mention, which is the legal profession. Um, hmm? Because, again, oh, yeah. one of the huge cost drivers, we believe, in the uh, US sector, and it's, we're getting it over here is the, the cost of litigation. Mm -hmm. uh, and um, you talked about key policy and legal issues, and you talked about malpractice. I mean, some of the responses to the complexity of AI is to say, let's simplify that whole potential liability. Let's just have, for example, New Zealand, they just have a no-fault no um, fund that pays out for damage cause, the tortious damage cause. And perhaps we can simplify our legal systems to actually reduce the cost that can arise from, from litigation through the complexity of AI. Right. So I, I just see law as a potential stagnant sector itself. Oh, sure. No, and I, I, have a, uh, I have a long article on, on the legal profession I'd, I'd be happy to share in terms of my views on the degree to which the law is susceptible to um, automation. And to get to your immediate point, I do want to question one premise in terms of the cost of malpractice. I think there's a good book by Tom Baker called The Malpractice Myth where he traces the rise and fall of, mal of malpractice insurance premiums more to gyrations in the financial sector and the ability of insurers to sort of make money off their investments than to changes in the um, uh, uh, malpractice liability. I'd also say that if you look state by state in America, there are radically different regimes of medical malpractice, but they don't seem to be driving cost variation by state. So I would not necessarily identify that as, the, as a huge driver of medical costs. But what I would say, though, in terms of simplifying is that a lot depends on values, right? And I would say that like, if you had to choose, if I were uh, Solon giving out the laws of medicine and compensation, I would certainly choose something like a model more along the lines of the US vaccine court which you know, does not try to find who's to blame, and et cetera, than I would current medical malpractice systems. So yeah, I mean, you could definitely find, you could rationalize that in certain ways. Um, yeah, yeah, but, I, but, I, I, the, the med, but the legal profession is such a hard one because you know, there is so much enthusiasm. If you search on the legal tech hashtag on Twitter right now, I promise you today you'll see 57 tweets or more talking about how software is just about to knock out all the lawyers and thank God, that, that rotten lot. You know? But you know, if, you, if you think about it, like, and, and a lot of times it's puffed as people who've never been able to afford a lawyer now can download the software and they have a, a software lawyer. But there's a reverse side to this always. For example, in the US, one of the leading uh, examples of legal technology is a company called Click Notices. It automates eviction. So if you're $25 late, uh, short on your rent for three days, lawyer, the, your landlord just sends an email, click notices, bam, 
you know, you're going to get the mailing. It's going to automatically tailor it to you. You're going to be given a certain number of days. They send some, somebody to the court. Often it doesn't have to be a lawyer. They send somebody there. And they've automated the process of knocking people out of homes. And so this is a process where, you know, I think that the same types of inequalities that, you know, characterize the current legal sector will only be exacerbated by a lot of the technological diffusion. They won't be uh, ameliorated by it. Other questions? So I, I, I'm a PhD student. I study inequality. Mm -hmm. and I'm kind of thinking back to, you know, in the 50s and 60s, we had all these people who used to work as secretaries. Oh, yes. And one of the consequences of IA is that it's a lot easier for people to do their work with less human assistance. Sure. You still have the same number of people in the professional fields, but they have less uh, low-paid assistance. And so I kind of question if the education and healthcare sectors increase to a very large share of GDP, and you have a lot of right. IA, are you really going to be able to add that many people to these sectors, particularly if you are professionalizing <laughs> nurses and, and uh, other elements of these sectors which are doing what assistant work there is to be done? Sure. Might this just result in a very wide distribution of wealth and income with a lot of people kind of priced out of the labor market? Got it. So the worry that you're having is that essentially, I mean, and so let me start with the secretary one um, in terms of, you know, and I will not dispute that a lot of secretaries and assistants have been put out of work by things like Microsoft Word and other, other things like that. I will say, though, that um, if you look at James Besson's work uh, in this book, Learning by Doing, he points out that there are many occupations where the received wisdom is technology just knocked out tons of people, and in fact, it didn't. So for example, like bank tellers. You would think, wow, automatic telling machine, forget it. There goes the bank teller occupation. At least in the US, lots of these jobs were kept because banks started moving into other Things. They started saying, oh, well, you're going to have people to guide you for your savings or guide you for investment, et cetera. Now, of course, I'm not necessarily endorsing that either, because if we look at the Wells Fargo scandal in the US, what were a lot of these people who are still occupied at the bank branches doing? They were upselling people into accounts they didn't need, right? <laughs> so, and that again comes back to Baumol's article on unproductive entrepreneurship, right? We have to have a much more substantive a theory of economic activity than we currently have. You know, I think people like Marana Mazzucato are developing that. I think there are, uh, and Pettifor, others are, are, are developing things, a more substantive theory of the economy. But we, we need that. Now the question of, you know, am I knocking people out by sort of creating a certain tier of work that requires, say, too much education, too much compensation, et cetera. I mean, I think that my perspective on that would be that, there's cert that the role of the professions often is to create certain market shelters to create space for professional autonomy, for security, for stability. And I would say one of the things that I find most ironic often in the counter argument there is, um, I was actually recently at a workshop in Germany um, uh, where we were talking about the potential of taxing Google and Facebook in order to support other uh, content industries that have been disintermediated and where the advertising is drawn away from them, et cetera. And one of the funniest things about the, the, the or one of the mo most striking confrontations during the workshop was there was a tenured professor who said, well, if we do this tax, we've got to make sure we don't give any of this money to established media firms because it should all go to startups because these established media firms, they're just dinosaurs and, you know, we, we wouldn't want to help them. And then a, a person who was uh, at the meeting spoke up and said, excuse me. You know, I'm an investigative journalist. The place where I wanted to live my life's vocation, it's cut back about 50% of the investigative journalists. All of the people of my age who are in investigative journalism, we're living hand to mouth. We don't know where we're going to get our next paycheck. How can, and, and she didn't, she was too polite to point out the difference, but you know, my question would be, how can someone with a tenured position sort of be prescribing precarity for all these other people? It's very strange, right? And so to me, I mean, I, my thought is that you know, I can see, and I mean, I certainly, when I hear, whenever I hear Tyler Cowen prescribing precarity, I'm like, yeah, it's easy to do that from a perch at George Mason University, you know. Uh, but I, I really think that we have to think about what are the conditions of work that give people some level of autonomy, of perspective, of time to develop themselves and to sort of develop a professional role. 
and nurture that. You know, I, I think the race to the bottom is not one that we can win. Can yeah. I, can I oh, sorry. Okay. Yeah. I mean, one of the discussions that goes on here now is about narratives about AI. Mm -hmm. And one of the stri striking things about your talk is that um, it reminded me that there are very few narratives about AI along the lines that you're, um, you're, you, you've, you've advanced in this talk. Yeah. Why do you think that is? I mean, most of, most of the narrative is, is about Frey and Osborne and, and the inexplicable march of, of, of the technology. It's the, it's the argument of the Suskins. Mm -hmm. For example, mm -hmm. and so on. Why is, why is that the dominant narrative? Why, or am I just missing something? Can I do a search for the Frey and Osborne chart? Because I think this chart really tells a lot about the story, which is, you know, okay. I mean, the Frey and Osborne, what's interesting about Frey and Osborne is that, you know, even though they have that bottom line figure of 47% of jobs being gone or something like that, what's so odd to me is that they have this wonderfully nuanced chart where they actually say that in the professions that I'm talking about, they have low susceptibility to automation, education, healthcare, human services. That's at the core of their argument. But what amazes me and what is part of my project in terms of, and let me just see if I can find this quickly. This is a review I did of a book called The Future of the Professions and I, I put the chart in here. And what's sort of in the, sorry about this, what's, what's in the chart here is, you know, here's their famous chart, right? And this is where they talk about the the, the, they talk about men, the different types of jobs, education, legal community, healthcare practitioners and technical, et cetera. Look at the green. The green is where you have most of the low probability of people being knocked out of work. But I can promise you, and I have, I have written to numerous journalists about this who continually cite this study and say, this study shows the lawyers, all the jobs are gone for lawyers, all the jobs are gonna be gone for almost everybody, et cetera, and no one responds. And I actually address why no one responds in my manuscript, which is to say that what has happened to journalists, they are projecting their own experience onto everyone else. Okay? Yeah. So a lot of journalists have been entirely disintermediated by Google and Facebook, yeah. and their logic is, well, those are our bosses, so why are they gonna be everybody's bosses, right? I, I really believe that's what's happening. Yeah. And Phil, and then. Yeah, uh, this may be excessively positive, but there's a certain degree of adaptability, adaptation taking place. And I have a specific example that's, I think, very relevant to anybody who does any teaching at the University of Cambridge, as well as at many other institutions. So the web makes it mind, literally mindlessly easy to plagiarize. Yes. <laughs> there arose, west coast of the United States, a little company started by a couple of academics called iParadigm. You don't know iParadigm. You know Turnitin. Yeah. Turnitin is an automated technology for processing papers and tests and essays and what have you, and then comparing them not just against what's on the web, but against what must now be, it must be up to a billion pa uh, papers submitted or tests submitted by other people. Now, this is where the nuance comes in. Turnitin does not, as you all know who use it or who have been exposed to it, does not say, this student plagiarized this paragraph, and here's the source. It just flags it and says, you, the teacher, you, the professor, you, you, the scholar, you decide, does this constitute a careless missing footnote? Is this, on the other hand, a pattern that has been observed in this student over a period of time, and it's going too far? Yes. And do you flag it? as something that requires discipline or merely a casual intervention, suggestion, et cetera. So it becomes an intelligent assistant yes, yeah. for a professional, yes. but yes. does for that professional what that professional could never remotely do yes. on her own. Scan the web and a billion papers that have been submitted by other students. Yeah. So I, I think it's, a, it's an example where there is some responsiveness in the system. Turnitin couldn't exist without the web. It wouldn't be needed without the web, right? Um, but again, it does get down to what are you solving for? Are you solving for supporting and augmenting the capabilities of the professional or for replacing them? I I oh, but can, I, I think David may have to leave. Do, do, you, do you want to make comments? Yeah, yeah, I, I want to ask a question. I want to, 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 to,
Oh. So let's, 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 let's,
And that's one way this argument could go. Right, right. And I'm trying to say that the real experience of governance, this is kind of like, this is a bit resonant actually with Nancy Rosenblum's work on friendship, or not, on, on neighbors, on neighbor, neighborly relations. And she tries to characterize the relationship between neighbors as the ultimate, most important form of politics most people engage in. I would say most people's experience of work is the most important to them experience of politics that they engage in. So I guess what I'm trying to do is I'm trying to say that one aspect of professionalization and professional identity is that you are part of an enterprise where you are simultaneously trying to do a task, but also you have some role in defining the task and defining how the task is done better or worse. And I want to see more jobs like that. But when I think about politics as like who runs the government, I'm hoping, and who's elected, and who's elected? The, the election, yeah. I don't, I mean, it, it's hard to tell, like, how uh, is that going to be a, I mean, I think certainly the lesson of, <laughs> let, me, let me try to build from a funny intersection with this talk, which is Trump's Treasury Secretary Mnuchin was recently asked, I'll go back a little bit further, Obama and his administration had a number of very top people at the Office of Science and Technology Policy thinking hard about the future of automation. I did one of their workshops, uh, uh, and there are other White House workshops all across the country. They wrote reports, they had Ed Felton on it, they had the best minds in technology and politics on this problem. They said it's a serious problem, they had internal debates, et cetera. The only thing we have heard from the Trump administration so far is from the Treasury Secretary was asked at a meeting, what do you think of the problem of automation? He said, not even on our radar. Not nothing, we think nothing about it. Who cares, the science fiction stuff. Clearly, one, re one response is better, okay? I refuse to even accept that it's a political question as to whether, either, whether Trump's or Mnuchin's response is better than the uh, Felton and Furman and the Obama people's. I think that's obvious. Now, folks may say to me, and by the way, I was, I was just attacked yesterday in the Irish Times by a conservative commentator for a talk I gave in Berlin uh, about of being an elitist and thinking, you know, I'm smarter than everybody else or whatever. You know, but I, I, I can't say that, I simply cannot accept that it's simply a matter of, of political preference or aesthetic preference whether we should care and think about the future of automation or not. And so I guess what I, I, my final response to the question would be that that contrast leads me to think that there needs to be at least some baseline of professionalism and education among those who would be our leaders, right? And that if you would go with William F. Buckley's Throw, tossed off idea that the t first eight names in the Cambridge phone book would be better than the current uh, uh, governors of Cambridge, Massachusetts, right? If you go with, I, I can't agree with that. I can't see that being true. But what would the problem be of professionalizing? I guess the, the minimal question, then the question is, what's that minimal level, right? And that's that I have not articulated. That would be a hard problem for this book. <laughs> but, but I would love to hear about work that tries to articulate that minimal level. Fools, the professionalization of everything, which is, you know, is a, it's, a, it's a bridal strand and a Frankfurt strand about yes. the way modernity is trying. Right. But there is, I mean, in terms of politics, is a vocation, right? I mean, politics is not just sort of thought of as something that's like a Schmidtian view of yeah. friend versus enemy. I mean, it is a vocation. It could be done better and worse, I would think. The strong and slow boring of hard boards, you know, that sort of thing. So, <laughs> sorry to. Most of this conversation comes down to cliches like race against the machine. <laughs> In this case, I'm racing against the clock. We have to stop. Oh, sorry. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.